Turner and another. And yes, um, <coughs> Mr. Colville, Miss Aslow, we're sorry to have kept you waiting. My Lord, I'm, I'm grateful. Um, I, was, I likewise was caught, 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 caught on the security this, e this morning. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> security is definitely working. <laughs> Um, my Lords, this is an appeal against the order of Her Honour Judge Venn, um, dated, um, uh, dated the 26th of October 2023, again, uh, uh, committing the uh, appellant uh, to prison for a period of 252 days as a result of his breach uh, of the order, the injunction that she made on the 22nd of September 2022. Um, <coughs> My lords will have the um, uh, will have the bundles, the core bundle, the supplementary bundle, a bundle of joint bundle of authorities, uh, and my lords, I have the hard copy of the authorities that my, my lord referred to uh, in the three cases which I'll deal Thank with. Thank you. Well, that was very much a for completeness exercise, and indeed, but, but rather than us starting talking about cases and indeed, it's, it's, to give you a chance it's very to useful to have um, advanced knowledge in the sense of of an issue that. Um, that, that's clearly relevant for this, this, this appeal. My Lord, the appellant himself <coughs> isn't, uh, isn't in attendance today, production order, confusion over con production order, uh, in, in, and, and, but I'm instructed to, to continue with the appeal in any event. His, his wife is at the back of the court, um, my Lords. Um, so, uh, and my Lords, we're very grateful that the court has been able to expedite this appeal and bring it forward in such swift fa fashion given that the appeal was only issued on the, on the 15th of November of this year. Um, the, uh, <coughs> and we received the approved judgment on the 1st of December. Um, my Lords, the, uh, uh, following the receipt of the approved judgment, um, there is uh, an uh, there's an application to amend the grounds. My Lords will see the amended grounds within the bundle. Uh, I don't believe it's opposed. Uh, and my learned friends are that right? Right? My Lord, that's correct. It's not uh, th that's very sensible. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Lord. I'm grateful to my learned friend. Um, my Lord, the, the, if I can start the context of the, by going to the order itself so we can see the, the, the order against which the appellant was then judged to have breached that order, it's found at page 106 in the bundle. <coughs> it's a core bundle at page 106. Uh, and in, in essence, and in a nutshell, whilst the uh, evidence and the, de the facts are de detailed and convoluted, uh, it's a property dispute, a boundary dispute, and property dispute uh, between the parties. Uh, and the the, the judge, her Honour Judge Venn, made a number of declarations, and then in the, uh, page 107 sets out the uh, injunction <coughs> and the requirements. So at that hearing, um, counsel, different counsel appeared for the um, respondents to this appeal, and um, Mr. and Mrs. Coates appeared in person. Yes, indeed, that's quite. Uh, we, but it wasn't my learned friend, nor uh, and the the appellant was a litigant in person. It's a point I'll come to in a moment. Yes, um, my lord, the um, to note what I would uh, ask the court to note on page one hundred and eight is the damages that were ordered on top of the injunction, uh, totalling uh, two hundred and sixty thousand pounds for um, uh, 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 for, for trespass and uh, further additional damages for distress and anxiety um, and nuisance uh, totalling £260,000 and then costs on top of that to be subject to detailed assessment. So yes. the, uh, paid the, or not paid? Sorry? Paid or not paid? Not, not, not assessed at the minute. No, but the damages? The damages, as I, I, I understand, I don't believe... I, I, don't, I can take instructions, but um, I don't believe they have... I, I haven't been instructed that they've been paid. I thought I just turned my back. My selection solicitor confirms that no damages have been paid to this date. They, they weren't paid. The, the the effect of the order will be that the defendant's house will have to be sold to pay the damages. Yes. Um, and, and that will be a process that will have to go through. Uh, yes. The usual steps, as because he, as one can see from the transcript, um, there was no. <coughs> the defendant said he had no means to be able to pay it. So uh, that that his only asset is the house. My lord, the. That's the, the order. The committal uh, order itself, which is subject to this appeal at page 28 of the bundle, um, and the judge, page, um, page 30, sentence was 252 days, <coughs> which my lords will see from the um, sentencing judgment was reduced 
to six by, uh, to that number from 420 uh, days down to 252. My lords, the um, the uh, appeal is uh, brought. My lord has my learned friend and my skeleton arguments in on the issues. Um, can I take? My can I just before we go into the substance of it, um, we're obviously um, grateful to you and, and those who instruct you. But there has been a legal aid certificate in effect. Um, how, how, how do you come to be here, and how do you, those who instruct you come to be here? Um, as a result of that legal aid certificate, my lords, yes. That's, uh, I'm instructed by Bolton Co, who are instructed by the uh, appellant under that legal aid certificate. Right, but that's a fresh instruction since the trial it itself. Is, yes, my lord, yes. Different solicitors. Different solicitors. Yeah. My lord, sorry, I apologise, didn't make it clear. Um, my lord will see that um, as part of the chronology, there was a firm of solicitors yes. that were on the record and they had struggled to obtain, uh, to instruct counsel to attend the trial of the, for, for the injunction. And on the 24th of October, <coughs> my lords will see that order of the 24th of October at the back of the bundle, page, um, page 121, the court ordered that they could come off the record, thereby leaving the defendant as a litigant in person. Uh, and one of the one of the issues which I um, which I come to on ground one is that it was obvious that he was a man who struggled um, because he was faced with what was a very serious um, uh, application and allegations, and he was uh, de trying to deal with it himself. Uh, and indeed, he applied to adjourn for to to obtain separate uh, fresh legal representation, and that application was refused. So it proceeded in. In, in, in having refused that application, he then had to represent himself. The uh, it, it that that takes uh, conveniently into the issue of ground one, and that is that the um, ground in ground on ground one, the judge wrongly relied upon or referred to and relied upon the witness statement that had been produced by the uh, defendant. There were two witness statements. And I believe one statement from um, the defendant's wife, but that's not a document I have uh, seen, um, my lords. But the <coughs> the the um, uh, we can see from the transcript, if, which is in the supplementary bundle, my lords. Um, if I could ask you to turn to that. It starts at page one hundred and fifty-two of the supplementary bundle. <coughs> And um, uh, page 153, Honour Judge Venn goes through the warnings uh, in terms of the rights of the. Um, when we're dealing with this um, this ground one, this is the only ground that relates to the uh, finding of contempt. Yes. Right. The others are all to do with all sentence. All to do with sentence. Yes. My lord, yes. Um, my lord the. <coughs> uh, Mr. Sorry. On page 153. Just a moment. Sorry, sorry my lord. Um, I, I think he's... Thank you. Do go on. Oh. My lord, the, at page 153, Her Honour Judge Venn starts um, by uh, stating that he uh, has the right to legal advice and representations, Mr. Cook saying he would like it, and then the judge continued to, to give him advice in terms of his right to remain silent, his right to um, uh, not to, uh, if he exercised that right, there would be adverse influence drawn. Mr. Coates um, states he doesn't understand because I'm not legally represented. And then over the page, at page 154, Again, he, Mr. Coates, uh, third of the way down, talks of, um, explains that he has limited education, bad dyslexia, and three days' notice in terms of uh, trying to find a legal representation, etc. And then, judge at the bottom of the page, um, judge then states it, it's unfortunate um, in reference to the order made by his honour judge Simplicus, which provided that a witness statement should be served. Um, uh, that it's unfortunate that that order um, 
requiring the defendant to produce a witness statement by a given date um, that uh, a deadline uh, by which you had to send the witness statement because you had, you have the right not to put any evidence in. Now, if you wish to exercise that right today, we can facilitate that by removing your statement from the table. And it is something you might want a couple of minutes to think about. So you have a choice. You can give evidence on everything. You can give evidence on nothing or you can give evidence on some things. But nobody can make you give evidence. So do you want to put those statements in? We can remove them and, and we can have uh, no regard to them. So it's something I will give you time to think about. Uh, Mr. Coach um, states, I'm not legally elected into it. I don't have uh, no one to seek proper advice about those statements, so I couldn't tell you whether or not they should or, uh, stay in or not. They literally, they, they literally just said that if we don't, uh, it, you've literally just said that if you, we don't, do not speak, you will hold this against us, or may, you may possibly hold against us. We, you've literally said just that. <clears throat> You're absolutely right, said Judge Venn, and, and Mr. Coates says, so I don't have any option, really. I stand by my statements. Um, uh, he then um, it goes on, and it's clear that he's uh, not fully understanding the, um, the position in terms of his rights, as my submission, uh, and um, he then applies for the adjournment, uh, and which is then refused. What we can then, uh, fast forwarding through the trial, the, um, the evidence, is the payments, uh, the applicants give evidence, Mr. Coates cross-examines the, um, the, the, the witness, uh, uh, and then we, at page 240, my lords will the see... Cross -examination, his cross-examination begins at 190, doesn't it? <coughs> Yes, it, it cross examination, my lord. Yes, and um, I'm just and it finishes on two forty. Two forty. So lord, yes. So he, he he cross examines for fifty pages. He does. Um, he then is asked. Uh, then this, he's asked. <coughs> you have the right at the bottom of the page at two forty, my lord. We'll see, Judge Van Wright, Mr. Coates, you you. Would, would you like to call uh, as a witness? I, I, I'm going to be calling no witnesses at all, Your Honour. I stand by my comments that I've made in. Well, hang on. Let, let me know. I, I'm not going to be blackmailed again. I'm not trying to blackmail you. I'm trying to tell you... Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that you cannot stand by any comments you've made because they are not uh, given in evidence. Um, they have been given evidence. Well, if you're not coming, going to come blackmailing me I, I, and confirm the truth of the evidence, that might cause you some difficulties. That is all I'm warning you. Uh, Mr. Coates, I, don't, I do not have to speak, and you have confirmed to me that I do not have to give oral. Um, I have given oral, sorry, not oral, written. I have provided written statements and stand by my written statements. And Judge Venn just makes, uh, just makes the statement that does not speak to the contents of it and will not be asked questions about it. It has impact on the weight um, that I can place on it, on the statement effectively. I think it becomes hearsay. Is that right, Miss Anslow? And then Miss Anslow says that it has very minimal weight. Um, and then Mr. Coates, I stand by my witness statement, which I've made. We both stand by our written, written evidence. I believe I've proved beyond reasonable doubt that there is no evidence. If you're not going to give it evidence, what am I going? To, what I'm going to ask Miss Answer to do is set out your case. So effectively, moving straight, straight to closing submissions on the evidence. So <clears throat> no evidence. The the, the uh, appellant elected to give no evidence. He gave no evidence. The witness statements were not adduced as evidence, uh, and <clears throat> the, the 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 approach of the court was to move straight to submissions. When, um, why do you say the, the witness statements were not adduced as evidence? They were not. Um, what, what does we stand by our written evidence mean? Well, if the... Um, there was, this is where the difficulty arises, the, the, defendant, the, the appellant being a litigant in person. He, he understands he doesn't have to give evidence that would incriminate, or, or indeed then subject himself to cross-examination. Um, but he didn't 
present my submission. He doesn't present to the court, this is my evidence. Um, and therefore, because that would then mean he is tendering himself as a witness. He would have to come into the court, into the witness box, to confirm that that is a statement that his stands as his evidence and then be cross-examined on it. I mean, he, he was seeking to opt for something which a lawyer would have known was Perhaps. not an option exactly. available to him. My, my lord's quite right. It's not an option to say, this is my evidence, but it's not really my evidence. So um, you can't cross-examine me, but uh, you can rely on it as far as it helps me, but you can't rely on it if it doesn't help me. It's, it's a mash. And that's, a, that's the, it's the consequence of a litigant in person seeking to act for himself in what is a serious, <clears throat> serious matter and with serious ramifications, and then, in a sense, press, pressing on with the misunderstanding. Can we, can we just go back at that Madam. stage? Forget, forget about the fact that the statements were filed um, by leave of an order. Yes. Um, and just consider them. Firstly, um, is there an obligation that they should be sworn statements if they are to be considered in They should be added. The, 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 the evidence in a uh, contempt application should be affidavit evidence. Well, that's certainly true for the applicant. It's certainly true for the applicant. Is it true for the for the respondent? The, the, no, no, because the, there's no requirement for the respondent to yeah. engage. That's the starting point. The uh, starting point is that the it's for the applicant to prove on the criminal standard that the breach has occurred, uh, and it cannot rely upon um, uh, the witness statement or the evidence of the defendant unless he's deployed, I mean, taking the case that my Lord referred to uh, in, in Re B, um, it has to be deployed by the witness, by the defendant, and then he is then subject to cross-examination on it, having presented himself as a... So let's say that having got to the point where um, on the 2nd of September these statements were filed yes. and served, um, uh, they were then you say, capable of becoming evidence, but they have not yet become they have evidence not yet. in the proceedings. Yes, because he had elected not to give evidence, to having been advised by the judge that he doesn't have to give evidence, but there would be consequences through adverse inference, but he doesn't have to give the evidence that would effectively lead to potential incrimination. I mean, the judge was obviously... <clears throat> trying her best yeah, and giving I, I, the warning I, earlier. Yeah. But do you say, well, you, you're dealing with a litigant in person? Yes. And, and where there is doubt in a, 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 a contempt application, that doubt should, um, uh, any resolution of that doubt should <coughs> fall in the favour of the defendant who's the litigant. Right, but can, can we again, I'm sorry to be pedestrian about this, no, no. but let's put ourselves at the point on page uh, 241, which you've just been no, no. taking us to, um, where the judge and Mr. Coates are having this exchange. Um, and uh, at that point, what Mr. Coates wants is he wants his statements to be evidence, but he does not wish to be cross-examined on them. Yeah. That is a course which is open to him, is it not? My Lord... Um, right, my lord is shaking, <laughs> shaking his head because um, um, that conflicts with what um, you said a moment ago. It does, my, my lord. I, 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 if one starts from the premise, the starting point is that the, it's for the applicant in the committal contempt application to to prove the breach. Yes. Um, they have got to. Um, they cannot rely upon the evidence of the defendant unless he has deployed himself. As a, in as as a witness or as a, in, in well, let's suppose. I, mean, I, I don't suppose it would be suggested that if Mr. Coates had said, "Well, I want my statements to be considered by you, Judge," I'm prepared to go into the witness box and affirm mm -hmm. their truth, yes. but I'm not prepared to answer any other questions. Yes. At What's wrong with point, that? At that point, the um, well, he, is there anything wrong with that? Um, I mean, it's not going to. His statements may not count for anything. I appreciate that, but he, is there he anything wrong with be, that structurally? He would. He would. He can say that he uh, won't answer any questions, and in, but he would have to get into the witness box, 
um, give the evidence in chief uh, by confirming that the witness statements are true to the best of his knowledge yes. and belief, it's confirming the statement of truth, and then that stands as his evidence in chief, which you would then be. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm interrogating uh, 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 before my lord uh, um, uh, uh, comes back on this. I'm, in, I'm interrogating this. So, um, you, you say that um, what makes the difference is somebody walking across the room and going into the witness box and affirming. Um, would it have made any difference if this had been an affidavit, two long affidavits with exhibits? Um, my lord, I think my, my submission would be that there has to be evidence uh, and evidence tendered as evidence um, in uh, in uh, and would in 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 a committal uh, sorry a contempt application um, there must be physical evidence given by by the witness in the witness box. So there's there's a difference between in my submission a witness a witness statement being prepared and a witness going into a witness box and confirming that statement <coughs> because that statement can stand as their evidence in chief of are, what they are say. Are committal proceedings interlocutory proceedings for the purposes of the CPL? Um, they would be interlocutory. Um, is there not a general provision in the CPL saying that evidence at trial is primarily to be given by oral evidence but evidence in other proceedings can be given by witness statement or affidavit? Um, in, if one goes back to the, it's for the uh, applicant to prove, uh, how do they prove the uh, prove they have to, that, that there has been a... Uh, they have to serve an affidavit. They have to serve the affidavit. And it's, then they have to attend for cross-examination if the defendant wants to cross-examine them. But suppose the defendant says, suppose, suppose the applicant serves seven affidavits and, and the defendant says, I only want to cross-examine two of them. Does the evidence of the other five, does it stand? Or do they have to come along to a court, go into the if witness box? If, if the evidence is not disputed, then the evidence can be tendered undisputed. But if it's... It, <clears throat> the, the, the defendant would always have the right to uh, seek to cross-examine so at the start of the proceedings, those seven witnesses, of which uh, they, they, they must, on my submission, must be prepared to come to court unless... Tender, tender for cross-examination unless told, unless told, told otherwise. otherwise. Previously, but it was not necessary. Yes. It, given, given that the, as in this case, it's, uh, it has led to a, a significant custodial sentence, the court must, particularly where there's a litigant in person involved, the court must be... See, seen in my submission to um, ensure that uh, that that the fairness in sh enables um, the evidence to be clearly presented because the breaches have to be clearly I'm set out. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned not about the um, applicant for committal, Hello. but about fairness to the um, respondent. Yes. And I'm I'm trying to interrogate, and I'll give way to my lord. <laughs> I'm trying to interrogate why on earth. Um, if somebody puts in a statement, says that they don't wish to um, give evidence but wish to rely upon the statement, um, are warned that that may not help them much, but that's nevertheless what they wish to do. And let's assume that the statement actually is not inculpatory, that it in fact gives all sorts of good information from their point of view. And, um, uh, why does it make a difference that they go into the witness box and say they'd want to do this rather than say it from the well of the court? It, it seems to me to deprive people of potential protections if they can't deploy their response to a committal application as best they want. Because if they, if a, if a respondent um, doesn't uh, just hands up a witness statement and say that's my evidence, then the applicant will say, will no doubt respond. Well, I I don't accept. I must be entitled to cross examine. Uh, that is that is just a statement of. Uh, of fact, call it an affidavit, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, whatever it, it, whatever it is, the 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 defendant has put forward his version of events. The applicant would is being denied the right to cross-examine, and uh, the statement. What weight does the statement have in my submission? It doesn't stand as evidence of fact or, or for the court to judge. So what we're saying here is that the is that people in the position of your client. Have got a right to total silence, but they don't have a right to partial silence. They have a right to partial silence because they can go into the witness box, they can produce the witness statement and say, This is my evidence, 
and then be asked questions on it and refuse to answer questions. Right, on so the that's the right to partial silence. That's the right and, to partial and, silence. And, and that is achieved merely by going to, as if there's some, um, there, 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 there is some um, sacramental but the, effect the, of, of, of walking into the witness box. Well, my lord, the, it, it's the same as in any interview, um, in a criminal matter, um, where there, there's the right to no comment. Um, and at, during the course of the interview, at some point, as in the course of cross-examination, the, the defendant may actually start to give a bit more or give a response, which then produces um, a further amplification or understanding of the, of the weight to which uh, the, the, the fact that's been commented on and the weight to be attached to that. Sorry. Sorry, my Back to my yeah, well, well, yeah. I, sus <laughs> I suspect my instincts are in line with what you're suggesting. Um, I can't see that a respondent is entitled to rely on anything that they have said unless they put themselves forward for cross-examination if the applicant wants that. And from the applicant's point of view, they've got to ask for cross-examination because otherwise they're bound by the contents of the affidavit yes. or the witness statement. Yes. Um, uh, there are very rare exceptions. Well, not entirely rare, but there are exceptional circumstances in which you can disregard even at in, at an interlocutory stage, um, uh, uh, what has been said in a witness statement, but that's normally because it's simply incredible. In, a, in contempt proceedings, I would have thought that it is, as you say, either the witness puts himself forward for cross-examination, or he can't rely at all on what he has said. Yes. The other side may be able to rely on what he has said for admissions, but I can't see that the respondent himself could make any use of his evidence. In, 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 in my lord, I, I agree with my lord on that. In that, once the um, there there has to be um, an election by the defendant to give um, uh, to to give evidence in the proceedings, and once he um, puts forward himself, whether it be via witness statement through uh, confirming it in the witness box, having sworn uh, to tell uh, the, uh, sworn the oath. Uh, and confirm that the contents are true to the best of his knowledge and belief, then at that point, then it's a matter for, for the court to, the judge then, to balance up. But what the, what the in my submission, that where the judge has erred here is that, um, and it, uh, she does refer to the witness statement as confirmation of an admission and so on, but there is no evidence put forward and it's taken as if the witness right. statement is the evidence. Well, is that, we, we referred you to various cases, but have they just taken us to the point which They've we've now already point. reached? Yes. Right. Right. And it's, in B is, yes. the, is the case that I would right. um, uh, take, say that my Lord... The, Thank you. Do you want to, um, do you, you, you've kindly produced those in hard copies. I so have indeed. If, my Lord, if, the, the, the precise reference in B is at um, it's Mr. Ju uh, it's Justice Wall on page um, eight, sorry, six three eight between, uh, well, it's letter A to F, but in, but in particular, e, uh, particular E to F, and it um, talks about it until it's deployed. The word is deployed by. Do you have the? I do. Um, thanks for us. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, just while you're doing that, I mean, a sense of complication here is that, on a superficial reading at least, the respondent chooses to deploy his evidence in the sense that he says, well, um, I'm standing by what I've said. Yes. And then he uses at least the exhibits to it yes. in cross-examining. Um, but the difficulty with that is that he doesn't, as a non-lawyer, know the full picture. And, and if Mr. Uh, Coates had been represented at, on that occasion, one would say, well, his legal advice was that this is, and, and, and in a sense, I couldn't make the point because there had been a deployment on his behalf by the legal representative. The fact is, he's a litigant in person. Uh, in my submission, he must be treated in, 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 in a different way to that which if he was um, being represented by, by, by a firm of solicitors and by, and by counsel. Would you okay. just allow a moment to make a slide to read A to F on page 68? My Lord, yes. <coughs>
So you say what appears on that page is correct? My Lord, yes. And what do we then make for completeness of the fact that when cross-examining, copious reference is made to the exhibits, to the statements? To the statements. What, what is the uh, analysis of that? Um, my Lord, uh, as I understand it, those exhibits um, are documents that he could produce or rely on, as opposed to evidence. Um, well, I appreciate that they are attached to the exhibit, but as an exhibit to the statement. But um, given given the, com the, the conflict that there is between uh, I stand by my statement and uh, I'm not going to give any evidence, where there is any, um, where there is any doubt or where there is any, um, the, how should the court deal with that? It should, in my submission, in that tension, fall on the side of the of, of, of protecting the individual, namely the, the, the respondent, and... But uh, your, your, your short answer, as I understood it earlier on, is that, um, is, is that there's nothing wrong with that, yes. because he's simply putting documents yes. which happen to be part of an exhibit. Yeah. I mean, That's the complication here, I suppose, I mean, in general terms, I think you're saying, and I'm, my instinct is to agree with you, that in cross-examination you can put to a witness a document that is not otherwise the subject of evidence, yes. and then you get the witness's answer in relation to that document. Yes. I suppose the complication in this context would be that Judge Simpkiss is obviously given directions for evidence, Yes. and that might, might complicate the position, but then you say, well, the respondent was a litigant in person. Yes. So, so there should, to, to, in, terms, in terms of a contempt application, there needs to be a clarity in terms of what is the evidence that can be relied upon to determine the, the issue of contempt, uh, and that must drive the, the assessment of the evidence um, uh, by the judge at the conclusion of the closing submissions. Closing submissions cannot be seen as evidence uh, of fact, or taken as evidence of fact. Indeed, the judge on occasion had slipped into, well, he said in his submissions, well, Submission isn't is based on the evidence. It's not giving evidence, uh, and so the court, the judge, erred in both relying upon the referring to the witness statement in her determination of the issues of committal uh, of contempt, and uh, referring to what the what the uh, Mr. Cook said in submission. I'm taking you to say that the um, the line may be this some. Um, Clarity may be harder to achieve where you have these rare cases of a litigant in person I, I, respondent. I, I, I fully agree. Um, but but that it's all the more important whether the litigant important. in person responded. Indeed. One just has to read the transcript to see the difficulty and the tension that there was between what uh, the judge was trying to communicate and Mr. Cook's uh, lack of understanding and uh, didn't needed legal representation. And in a, in an ideal world, uh, all applicants or all sort of. Def um, respondents in, a, in an application of this nature would be legally represented to ensure fairness. But that's unfortunately not always the case, as in this case. So my Lord. it's implicit in what you've been saying. That, I mean, right at the outset of the hearing, the judge gave your client a choice. Yes. She said, you don't have to give evidence. So if you don't want to rely on your statement, I, I can take it out of the yes. bundle yes. And, and not read it. Yeah. Um, Implicitly, if not explicitly, she's saying the alternative is to leave it in, and then I will read it, and then it will become your your what you want to say. But then, once I've read it, then then it's available, and and obviously, once something is in evidence, it's evidence for all parties, for all purposes. What I've been struggling with, and still am not entirely clear about, is this: that normally statements made out of court, that is not evidence deployed in court, but statements made out of court, are admissible as hearsay. And if they contain admissions, they're admissible as admissions. And it, it, so if he'd written a letter to the claimants on receiving the application for committal, saying, well, I did do this, but they could put that in as an admission. 
And I think it's part of your, which is how the judge relied on his statement as admissions. I think it's part of your submission, must be part of your submission, that by putting in a witness statement, which in the event he doesn't go into the witness box and adopt, he's not admitting anything and it can't be used even as a hearsay statement. And I just wonder why not. Um, because we are dealing with crim a criminal. First of all, it's a crim it's, it's criminal but, uh, burden. Um, it's for the claimant uh, to prove, not the defendant to disprove. Um, the uh, the the defendant has the right to not uh, give evidence, uh, and he cannot be. He cannot be required, in a sense, or cannot be, uh, give evidence by sidewind. Well, I mean, this is what I have a problem with, because in a criminal case, of course, you do put in, as hearsay, admissions made in interviews. And that's why interviews go in, because they contain admissions. Yes. So if somebody charged with a criminal offence, or in this case, charged with a breach of an order, makes an admission, out of court, that can be relied on as part of the prosecution, or in this case the application, as supporting evidence. And that doesn't either cut across the fact that it is for the prosecution, or in this case the applicant, to prove the case, or the, or the standard or burden of proof, or the fact that in general somebody charged with a criminal offence or charged with a contempt of court doesn't have to say anything. But if they volunteer an admission, that can be relied on. Yes. So, as I say, I think, logically, if somebody charged with a committal writes a letter admitting the facts, but giving excuses, that could be deployed by the applicant as part of their case. My Lord, in the facts of this, I, I, I understand my Lord's uh, point. In the facts of this case, the witness statements were produced as a result of the court order, which the uh, which the judge acknowledged should uh, should not have uh, should have been made in terms of if you want to put a statement in, you can, whereas the order required him to give a statement by a certain date. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not quite we, sure have about we, that. Have, have we seen that order? Yes, um, my lord, it's referred to. I don't have the order. But it's referred to. It's referred to in the transcript. In the transcript of the judgment. Um, 154. It was unfortunate it was made telling you you had a deadline by which you had to send written statements in. It said, the, the order, I, I've, I've seen this order. Um, it says, if you want to file evidence, you've got to file it by a certain date. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, my Lord, I don't think it says if you want to file evidence. But can we. Uh, my Lord, I think it's any evidence on which you wish to rely it may, it must be filed by a certain date. Let's find it. Go my Lord, yes. I, I think it's in the, I, I, find, I saw in the judgment um, my Lord at page 41 thank you page uh, para 32 yes any evidence that they intend to rely on and, and then at paragraph 33, it's regrettable that the judge made a mandatory order. He should have made provision for what he said uh, because, of course, they have the right to silence. So the, the, the But Mr. Justice, Mr. Justice Ward of Reby says there's, it makes perfect sense to require a, a respondent to put, a, put statements in. If that he so wishes. If they wish, but then that, then that doesn't prejudice them. But the... Um, it, it, I... I, I I accept what um, I, I accept uh, Her Honour Judge uh, Ben's regret because again um, this is uh, uh, the, the order as it's worded doesn't make clear that there is no requirement to give evidence that this yes, isn't what, what what is objectionable as I understand you to say is not what was ordered but what should also have been what should, what recorded should, in the order indeed. for the benefit of these. So that, so that he, so that Mr. Coates knew that he didn't have to give evidence, but if he wanted to give evidence to court, he had to do it right. by X date. Okay. And, and so it was the uh, 
So, so that's that produce that order then produces the witness statements, Two, which are, yeah. which which uh, when one looks at the sort of the criminal side in terms of um, interviews and admissions made in an interview, they're very different. Um, whereas because of an interview would always be started with you have the right to remain silent, you do not have to say anything unless you and so on. Um, whereas here there was no no such warning given. Now. Uh, in those circumstances where um, it, the litigant in person is presented with a requirement, oh, at the time he had legal representation, but the, um, when he appears for, at the trial, uh, the, witness, the, the witness statements are in the bundle. The judge took it, I mean, uh, in her um, exchanges with Mr. Coates, got very close to the position which I say she should have gone to the next step and that is to remove the witness statements from the bundle. One thing I can't remember jumping around is well, leave aside contempt. If there's a trial and there are directions for witness statements to be served and you serve witness statements in compliance with the directions and then you decide that you don't want to call the witness at trial, are you then allowed to pull back the witness statement and say nobody can rely on it? Well, at that point, it would be, um, it, it's a hearsay statement, isn't it? Well, I, I, I can't remember. I did once know something about this. I can't remember whether that's the outcome or not, or whether you're entitled to say, look, I served the witness statement it, it, against it, the possibility I was going to want to call this witness. But in circumstances where I've chosen not to call the witness, nobody can rely on it. But it and I uh, suspect part 32 might tell you something about it, but I haven't. Um, my, 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 my lord, if the witness statement is has been prepared as part of the trial and is in the bundle and the witness isn't called, then the witness statement is a um, it would have to be in a civil in a civil case it would be it would be admissible um, uh, but would be uh, in, uh, it would be hearsay um, and little wit can be attached to it because. The, the, there is it's not been produced in evidence or cross-examined on. Actually, that, you're quite right. that's provided for. Now look at it at uh, Rule 32.55. If a party who has served a witness statement doesn't call the witness, the other party can put the witness statement in as hearsay evidence. Yes, indeed. So it's civil evidence. Act. It wouldn't uh, be. It wouldn't have very little weight so far as they were concerned if it contained an admission against interest, for example. Well, but in terms of weight for the court to balance, it. it that there would be um, little weight to be attached to it. And well, I don't. I don't see why that's automatically the case. I mean, it might be. That it might attract little weight, but hearsay evidence can be um, very strong evidence um, if in appropriate it, circumstances. It, it depends. I mean, I, 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 let's suppose somebody decided not to call a witness because their case was was going to run onto the rocks as soon as the witness got into the witness box. Then the uncalled witness's witness statement might be extremely. Yes. Powerful document, um, my lord. It depends on the facts. But it depends on the facts. Uh, but the the um, but this this isn't a civil trial. No. Um, and, and that it's, it's, and that. And well, what that you're saying point, is that the judge should have gone one more step, um, which was following on from how she started off at the earlier reference. But the step that you say she should have taken is to say, Mr. Coates, um, either you're going to go into the witness box, which is entirely your choice, and you don't have to, yeah. or I'm going to treat that statement as. Not being those statements as not being in the bundle. Yes. Is that what you say she yes, should have said? That's what I say. At that have. point, Miss, Mr. Coates, who seems to have been attached to his statements, yes. um, might very well have said, "Well, my choice is I, 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 I'm going to go into the witness box Indeed. and affirm my statements, but I'm not going to say anything else." Indeed. For example. And and at that point, the evidence is evidence in in chief. It's a, it's uh, and has not been. He's refused to take questions. Therefore, adverse inferences right. can be drawn from that. Well, I think we've. Uh, I think it, it's I been very interesting, and I think we've, we've done that one to death. But what what um, what, what um, you've now got to show us is um, how that comes to be a serious procedural error that, that renders the um, the proceedings. Uh, well, the, 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 the fact that the judge took the statements into account in her mm. in her assessment of the allegations. Um, I say that leads to the um, the conclusion um, uh, being wrong in law. Right. It's not a question of it being wrong, wrong in law. Surely, is, is this this is a procedural step? Is it? Not? It was procedurally unfair to um, 
to take into account, uh, uh, and it's irregular, to take into account a witness statement that hasn't been produced, uh, hasn't been verified in evidence and produced in evidence, uh, and then rely upon that statement to... Yes, but the irregularity does, does it not, have to be of a serious nature, uh, causing injustice. Indeed. So what you're going to need, I speak for myself, yes. to show us so um, where? Where, where it went. Indeed. My Lord, um, the, can I take your Lordships to the, um, in the uh, judgment, in the bundle, in the core bundle, it starts at, um, it starts at page 30, um, 32, and um, my Lord, at paragraph 48, Page, page, um, page 46, and this is to deal with the first allegation, which was found to be proved, relating to the um, concrete block wall structure, um, at power 48, um, 49. But the, the basis on which the um Judge Fund, we're talking here about, oh, is it number one or number two? Number one. Number, number one. one is um, a paragraph 46. Yes. And 47. 47, yes. I mean, the, I think the point you have to meet, meet is, that, is that the whole thing stands up um, well, without any reference to, um, to, to what Mr. Coates may have said at all. Well, my lord, if the... Um, if the statement should never have been included or referred to, um, then in my submission, then the finding is tainted because there's reliance upon, as in paragraph 46, 48, sorry, he, um, a page, Mr. Cook says in his witness statement, she quotes, he says, trying to appeal, etc. Um, this, that is in paragraph 49, that is an admission that he has not complied with the order. So. It, the, the judge is uh, concluding that there's an admission by Mr. Coates when he had made no such admission in evidence. But, she says, on the basis of Mr. Coates' admission and the evidence I have seen from Ms. Turner, which yes. I believe I'm satisfied. And given the evidence from um, Mrs. Turner, was there any choice in the matter? I mean, did, he not have, did she not have to find that that allegation was proved? Um, my lord, the the fact that she took into account the, the admission from um, Mr. Coates from his witness statement and weighed to get, weighed that together with uh, the evidence of uh, Ms. Turner, it's effectively corroborating. But the, um, but the reasons which were given, I mean these bogus reasons, of paragraph forty-eight, um, to do with. Um, appeals and to do with transferring it to the um, son with a disability. Yes. I mean, it's all completely unnecessary, as it seems to me, to the judge's reasoning on this. I mean, I'm giving you an opportunity uh, no, um, indeed. <laughs> to deal yeah. with that point. I, indeed. My Lord, the, the fact that when we look at 49, the, the, uh, the conclusion that there has, it, that she's satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt that the first allegation is proved is a combination of the evidence. So we're not talking here about um, who did what on the footpath. Mm. Um, but there's a photograph, paragraph 47. Yes. Showing L straight shaped block structures. I mean, this, this is. It, it, it's a finding that objects are present in a particular place. Yes. And they are. Yes. And the reason that they haven't been taken down, according to your client, is because he doesn't believe he ought to. And further than that, he, because he's transferred it out of his control, he pretends that he can't. Mm -hmm. Well, my lord, uh, my point is that... Um, that you, you say know, that's fatal. 
Uh, indeed, I do. It's, it's all fair. Okay. Well, we've got, we've got your comment on that. Now, um, the, it, there's another reference. There's another it? reference. Page, uh, paragraph 62, my lord. Page 50. Page 50. What I say, my lord, is that... Did you um, say paragraph 62? 62, 62 got it, thank you. What? That, that's not reliance on the omission. It's reliance on the adverse inferences because you didn't give it. My, my lord, yes. Um, as I read the judgment... There is, uh, it's clear that the judge has, I mean, we know as a fact that the judge had the witness statements and she had read the witness statements uh, as, as part, of the, uh, part of the trial. Um, uh, and what I, I say is in terms of procedural unfairness is that the judge should have excluded the statement right from the very off in the, uh, in the um, at the very beginning of the at the beginning of the application, at the beginning of the hearing, and then the assessment would be simply based upon the evidence that she had heard, namely from Miss Turner uh, in her uh, in her evidence in chief and as subject to cross examination. So when there's reference to uh, witness statements, uh, didn't give it a uh, draw, um, cross examined on the evidence in his witness statement. Um, the judge is referring to a document which she has before her which, in my submission, she's clearly read and has taken into account. And procedural fairness requires required that to be excluded at the outset of the hearing and then the judge to move forward. And you, you don't make criticism of the judge for having read it in advance of the trial? Well, uh, I, uh, yes, in that um, the judge couldn't be criticised for it because it was in the bundle. Um, mm. But the, so well, the, ju the judge should have, excluded, they should have excluded it from the bundle and excluded it from her consideration and made it made it clear from the very beginning that she was determining the application based on right, the evidence. I think your that. second reference is not on this point, as we. My lord. Just, I think there's another one coming up in there. My lord, um, I think the other point is the same as the point I've just made. My lord. Um, <coughs> my lord, there's no apology. I've adopted, my lord. Um, to any other references, my lord, no. No, but, um, I'm just, I'm just looking at paragraph 83. I just want to be sure that we've got all the references to the statements. I'm not quite sure what the admission that the defendants had. My Lord, you're referring to paragraph 83? Yes, I'm just Oh, yes, my Lord. In part, there seems to be some sort I of... Can't, I can't quite make out what is, yeah. um, what is going on here. That, that, that really um, must refer back to the, the fact that there's a, te there's a witness statement in the bundle and that she's taken it into account, because that, that's the only basis on which there is an admission, or can be said to be an admission. Well, or, unless, it unless might be... It might be a reference back to what she says at paragraph 81. The first defendant declined the opportunity to explain the photo. He seemed to say that the cameras were either dummy cameras and were deactivated, or that they were not pointing at the claimant's property in his question. So she's picking up on his cross-examination. And then she makes the point, of course, questions are not evidence. He declined to give evidence. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's... Uh, and it may be, that you, my, my Lord's quite right in terms of paragraph 81, uh, it may also be come through from the submission point, because I yes. believe at some, at some point the judge refers to the submissions. Um, so it cannot be just uh, submissions are based on evidence, not or not, not evidence of fact. Well, so in the end, um, you, you've taken us to the earlier earlier one at um, 46 to 49. Is, is this passage 81 to 83 relied upon as showing some... Um, my lord in, in paragraph 83 floor. in part there seems to be some sort of admission but we don't but the, the reference to where the admission because again the absence of any evidence from the defendant 
there is there is no admission. I mean, your difficulty, as I, you obviously appreciate, is that there was evidence only one way. There was evidence from the Turners, backed by photographs. Mm. There was no evidence to contradict what they said at all. How could the judge reach any other conclusion but those that she did reach? But what I say, my lord, is that by going the next step on, by relying upon what the defendant either said in the witness statement or admissions, uh, where, wherever those admissions are from, when even if they were not necessary, it is procedurally unfair. It's gone, it's gone oh. further than what was required, and it t it taints the the the, the judgment. Right, my lord. Unless is that, is that, 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 that ground? That, that ground one. My Lord, I apologise, I've taken a lot longer. No, you've been uh, asked a lot of questions. My Lord, um, I can hopefully do the next grounds because it's written in sentence uh, yes. in quicker fashion. Um, the second ground is, um, deals with the uh, allegation uh, uh, of threatening behaviour arising from submissions that were made on the application for permission to appeal the oral application and perform Mr Justice Mead. Uh, my, in the judgment, um, if I can take my Lord to the judgment, it's the ninth allegation that starts at page, at the top of page 53, running through from paragraph 71 to 72. Uh, and the judge there can, um, quotes from the affidavit of Mrs Turner, and in the paragraph 71, it refers to, quote, the quote refers to jet, the exhibit jet, 40, jet 4, or jet 4, which my lord will, my lords will find at page 68 in the bundle, um, in the, uh, sorry, the supplementary bundle. My lord, the... That is an extract which, as I see, um, and I've read this extract, the, the threat of it can only escalate so it could end up probably being criminal, um, a, a criminal charge, a criminal matter because I can't make myself homeless, my family, um, or my family because something was not ju right or just. Um, I don't see that as a quote within the within that exhibit. But in any event, my lords, the I just, just pull it out. Sorry, my lord. Is there any purpose in us looking through other parts of the exhibits? Is it on page 75? Yes, sorry, I knew I'd read it. Um, ah, there we go. My lord, it's quite right, it's come. Jump. Yeah, my lord, that, uh, what, my lord spotted it. Well, uh, it, page 75, uh, it's a D uh, on the bars. Um, but one can see to see it to see it in context what this is an oral application for permission to appeal against the order of her honor judge ben making the injunction one has to then ask how is it that um, it is perceived to be a criminal, a, a threat of a criminal charge or to cause a, 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 to commit a crime. And it, my lords will recall that this is the most serious of all the allegations in terms of the sentence. What was um, sentenced uh, on this allegation being proved was 168 days. Um, 
just trying to put the two pages together. My lord, yes. The, um, just looking at the original numbering of page 68, it appears to be 17 or 19, 17, on the bottom right-hand corner. And my, my lord, it follows. The, it, it, it follows. The house is not even worth yes, that. Yes. The they're, they're, not, they're not cons Sorry, you say that follows. They are, they are consecutive. Yeah. The house is not even worth that, I see. The house right. is worth, I don't know, 400,000. Okay. Yes. So right, the so there's a two consecutive pages, so, yes. so that one can see that the judge is um, saying yes at the top of the first page, page 68. Then Mr. Coates is speaking without interruption, um, except from his wife on the second page. Yes. For um, two full pages. And um, you were clearly not making an argument that found favour in, res in relation to permission to appeal. Um, but putting his own point of view in relation to the order that the judge had made in the September hearing. Yes. Uh, and what was drawn from that quote is that Mr. Coates was threatening criminal action. Which meant it was a very serious, um, a very serious allegation that had been found to be proved. But this is a an oral application for permission to appeal. Um, it was a comment it seemed to be seen in that context to be said uh, it, it, to appeal against the. Do we know whether it was an in-court hearing or a, a remote hearing? Um, I think it was in court. It must have been in court. Um, My lord, that is our understanding. Yes, I think it was in court because Miss Turner refers to being in court. I attended a hearing. My lord, at para, page 53, para 71, the yes. quote. Well, she, she experienced it as being yet another threat. Um, but it wasn't perceived by anyone else. Indeed, indeed, the judge didn't consider it. So, well, excuse me, but what you've just said is could be perceived to be, are you threatening criminal conduct? Um, it was an observation being made that it can only escalate, that it, in a sense it's a make weight point, it's not actually, again it's a litigant in person, um, but there was no threat of direct uh, well, criminal. I mean, what, what it undoubtedly shows, apart from anything else, um, is a litigant saying, I'm never going to obey this order. Um, but that's not the, that, that's not what the finding is. Um, no. the, the, the finding is of a, of, of a threat. And could we look, please, at, um, you're coming to the judgment. Yes. And, if we could, if we could and, the, judgment, and the particular order that is under consideration. Uh, my Lord, the, um, if we go to the judgment, it's at page forty, page fifty-three, fifty-four. So the judge has cited that uh, from cited directly from Mrs. Turner's statement or affidavit, sorry, affidavit. Um, and then at power seventy-two, laughed when it was suggested that there was a clear threat in his own words in front of the judge. But it's difficult to see what he would, could possibly have meant if it were not a threat, a criminal charge, a criminal matter. He declined the opportunity to explain uh, his comments and evidence and to explain what else he could have possibly meant, satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. So, my lord, the... Um, Can we look at the order? The order. Of the paragraph order. 16. <coughs> my lord, just the order is... Um, Page 106. 108, paragraph 6. 108. Paragraph 16. Defendants shall not make verbal or abusive comments 
or engage in physically threatening behaviour, including but not limited to the following, or staring, or otherwise intimidate or harass the claimant, etc. Presumably it would have to be under the intimidate or harass bit, it's not physically threatening. No, indeed. Mm. But the, the, the comment wasn't directed at the, the claimants. Um, I mean, clearly, paragraph 16 um, mainly has in mind the sort of behaviour that led to the finding earlier on about um, abusive behaviour across the boundary. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, but it's not suggested that it isn't wide enough, for example, to encompass similar sorts of behaviour in the supermarket car park or indeed in a, in a courthouse. But it, 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 requires, it requires there to be um, intimidation. intimidation and harassment directed at the claimant or any other occupier, etc. Yes, I mean, I'm just making the point that it's not a geographical No, no I accept the word, yes. Um, the fact that it's in a courtroom does give it a special flavour because, yes. for example, if it was perceived to have been threatening behaviour, one might have expected the judge to have uh, not, not sat silent. Um, but it can only, as my Lord says, come under effectively that this submission made to a judge during the course of a permission hearing is intimidating behaviour. But it's not that the the comment wasn't a comment directed at the judge, via, uh, directed at the um, the claimant via that, that again. I mean, I, I'm trying to strip it down. No. I mean, and, and I hope not unhelpfully to, no, no, to to what it had to be if the judge's uh, submission uh, judge's finding is 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 um, sustainable. Yes. Um, so it, it can't be the case that the fact it was said to a judge in the presence of the neighbours. Yes would protect it if it was indeed a threat. Yes. Uh, you, you would accept that? I do. I mean, just suppose for the sake of argument that uh, uh, your client had said to the judge, it can only escalate, and so uh, if this order stands, I'm going to have to uh, go ahead and assault on my neighbours. Yes. That would, that that would, would be, be objectionable. That would be. Um, I mean, in, in a sense, the fact that Mr... Coates is a litigant in person, counts in his favour, in the sense that a lawyer would know that merely remaining on the property couldn't be a criminal matter. Yeah. But I don't know that a litigant in person would necessarily know that. No. no I mean, one interpretation is, presumably, uh, he hasn't given this interpretation, so we don't know it is, but I'm, you know, I'm going to have to be taken out of there kicking and screaming. Yes. And, and it may be, in a sense, that it, he would, but that's not a threat or a harassment directed at the claimant it is a statement of fact that a bailiff would have to come and drag me out because I'm not going to comply with this order. But that's not a breach of paragraph 16. No. So it doesn't go well for Mr Coates on mitigation No. Um, in relation to other matters, but you say it's not a breach. It's not a breach. Or if it is a breach, it certainly isn't a it's not maximum serious. It's not, this, um, not an A1, if I can put it, right? which is why the judge viewed it and, uh, and ordered that he's serve 168 days in prison <coughs> for it. Can I, can I be sure that I understand what you're saying? Are you saying that this is a, a sufficiently ambiguous statement that you can't be sure that, that it's a, a breach of paragraph 16 at all because although it's, it's a clear threat that he may end up committing a crime, it may not be a, a crime against, against the, the, the claimants. claimants. It may just be assaulting the bailiff yes. or locking himself into the house or whatever. Yes. It can, it, but my, that, that's as far as I can go with that. But my, my uh, sense, my second point, my, my fallback, is that even if... Even if it's technically a breach, it's not of the most serious type. Because it wasn't, it wasn't directing... Or no reasonable person would have concluded that it was intimidatory or harassment. Of the claimant when it was a part, it was a part of an oral submission to the to a, um, a high court judge on permission to appeal, and the judge didn't take objection or caution him that there was a this was a breach what he had just said of paragraph sixteen, and Miss um, Mrs Turner's here and has heard it, and you could arguably be so you need to be careful what you said. That was never part of the. Uh, 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 part of 
the response. There was no such response. So, my lord, um, I, 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 in a sense, can I ride the two horses? Um, uh, in the sense of, can it be a breach, or well, can, even if it not, is a not breach? Not at the same time. You can have the one after the other. <laughs> All right. Indeed. Is that ground two? That's ground two, my lord. Yes. Ground three. Um, the judge. Yes, the judge found that there were allegation, allegations 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 11 and 12 were approved and uh, she, what she does when sentencing she concludes that in terms of totality she adds up all the, um, all the sentences in respect of each allegation deducts uh, the num total number of days from 420 to 252 which represents 60 percent uh, and then uh, sentence the uh, Mr. Cooks to 252 days in prison. Uh, my submission she's bound to consider whether this should be run the sentences for each allegation should be run consecutively or sorry concurrently rather than consecutively and nowhere does she mention or does she consider that? She mentions it at the beginning of her sentence and judgment. She does at the beginning, but in terms of um, when. Uh, so you can't say, you can't say she wasn't aware of the position. Yes. But the, in terms of analysis, having got she goes through each one. My lords have read the sentence and judgment. Each one is um, number of days twenty eight, number of days one hundred ninety six, number of days, and then at the end totality and uh, deducts six, uh, to sixty percent. And uh, so, therefore, without any consideration as to whether at once that once she has identified what sentence is to be imposed in respect of each allegation, at that point, I would say the judge should have considered whether or not the sentences should run consecutively. Okay, the, the, the fault of um, method, you say, was the point where she came to addition. Yes, indeed. Um, that, that Assuming that they were all reasonable sentences, which you challenge, yes. um, it, it's all right for a judge to list all of these. And indeed, I think the um, um, the, the, the guidance um, of of, um, of this court is that it's good practice yes. to identify individual it is. sentences. Yes. All right. um, but after that. You say the safe thing is not to then add them all up and and, 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 and conduct a reduction exercise. No. The next question is, should these be concurrent or consecutive sentences? Yes. And in that respect, the totality principle um, would, would come into effect, namely one would consider whether this is part of the same course of conduct, yes. whether, it's, whether it's all the same thing or whether it's... Yes. Right. Um, Different sorts of Mother. in crime criminality. Yes. Yeah, contempt. Uh, uh, indeed. I, I, and uh, the approach. Once we get to the, that point in the judgment, the judge doesn't go through that analysis. And indeed, um, uh, one has to then ask the question: Well, uh, had she had, had she had considered it, would it be appropriate for the sentences to be uh, concurrent as opposed to consecutive? I mean, against that, it might be said, well, look, you can see from her judgment that she had in mind the possibility of concurrent sentences. And then when she comes to her conclusions, she stands back and she asks herself, what is the shortest possible sentence that she could pass that would be appropriate? And she comes up with 60%. Now, might that not be said to be an alternative way of undertaking a similar sort of thought process and one within well, the, if, the, the if they were all to run side by side it would obviously come out shorter but then she would think that that was too and she little. applied the 60% 60% of the of the longer sentence which was uh, allegation 9 which is 168 wrapped it down to 100 days so one can see that it, it it's not getting to the same conclusion <coughs> by, by a different means um, uh, it, 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 in my submission, the, the judge has got to consider 
once she's looked at each individual allegation, whether or not this is consecutive or concurrent sentence. I mean, plainly it comes out as a lower figure. But on the other hand, the judge has said she is satisfied that the, the shortest possible sentence I can appropriately pass is 252 days. So if she came up with some lower figure because of concurrent sentencing, that would be less than she thought appropriate. Um, my Lord, that's in it. Um, if one takes it through the logical steps, what are the allegations, what are the sentences in respect of the allegations, um, and then the next step, is it concurrent or consecutive, then we don't get to the reduction point. Um, uh, and in a sense, one's putting the cart before the horse in the sense of saying, well, what is the total number of days I think are suitable, and then working backwards to justify it in terms of hmm. the, the number of sentences really? and the length of sentence. Well, what is the consideration as to whether a sentence for more than one breach should be consecutive or concurrent? Um, where there are breaches, but they, in, re in relation to the facts, there is an overlap. Um, so <laughs> for example, um, in this case, it's, there's a clear neighbour dispute going on. There's certain aspects of that in terms of the threat the, the, the damage to the window, not removing the block wall. They're, they're all bu bundled up in the same um, uh, com uh, matrix of facts. Uh, and the judge has got well, to... they all arise out of the same dispute. Yes. There are discrete things. It's one thing just to fail to remove a wall which you've been ordered to remove. It's another thing to throw stones Other and make threatening and abusive yeah. statements. They're, they're not the same facts. I, I accept, my lord, they're not the same facts. So what is the test as to whether the sentences should have been... Because your submission is she should have separately considered whether they should have been consecutive or concurrent, and had she done so, she should have concluded that they should have been concurrent. Yes. Why should they have been concurrent? Because they, it, it all arises out of the same set of facts, dealing with the same set of dispute, the same dispute and the facts surrounding that dispute. They're different facets of the same yes. dispute and, and, it's and a the same unwillingness of your client to comply with the court order I, which was well, intended to put well, an end well, to yes. the dispute. But the, um, the judge has got to go through that exercise and say, well, actually, my findings of fact are such that these are independent and separate um, allegations, albeit a breach of the same order, but different, uh, succinct parts of that order which are separate and unrelated and therefore um, uh, uh, warrant uh, <coughs> sentencing set, you know, consecutive as opposed to concurrent. And, and that, that exercise hasn't been, the judge hasn't embarked on that. I accept that the, it's a, a, the judge has a discretion in terms of uh, reaching that. But we need to, the court, and in particular this court, need to be able to understand her reasoning so, on that. Um, the the judge, as you say, has a discretion. You say that this has the flavour that one would first look for concurrent sentences yes. and an explanation if they were to be consecutive. Yes. And it's not sufficient to to say, well, I will reduce it by forty percent because I think four hundred and twenty is probably going. Well, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to judges having to. Um, grapple with these matters. But, yes. Um, one might say, where does 40% come from? Um, you know, as opposed to 25% or 50% or yes. some other Indeed. round number. Indeed. Um, that having, having, having gone through the fine tooth comb of the grid, you say that, that that's not designed yes. to lead to a process of addition and, and, and then a, a broad axe just to bring it back a bit to what would be proportionate and reasonable. Um, that, uh, my submission, the, it is a staged st process and that, that the missing of that stage of should the sentences for each allegation, um, proven allegation, be concurrent or consecutive must be, um, must be born, in, uh, must be considered. Um, and if it is going to be uh, consecutive, then there must be reasons for it. Because clearly, consecutive is going to increase the length of time in custody. Could she have 
the a hybrid and said, well, I've got a couple of instances of yes. failing to remove things. I'll, I'll make those consecutive. Yeah. Then I've got verbal um, uh, behaviour, yeah. th threats. Uh, I've got filming, which is like... Uh, and then I've also got throwing stones, which is, again, something... Yeah. Like physical things. So put them into different boxes. I, I, the, I can't... I can't see why a judge couldn't compartmentalise. But what you're, you're saying is there needs to be some explanation. There must be a, some consideration, explanation, and reasons. Because uh, if 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 a uh, if a defendant is uh, sentenced to custody, he needs to know why the length of time is the length of time given. Um, in, in particular, where there's in this case a number of allegations that have been proved. So uh, um, the only explanation we have is, well, you, you've added up, the judge has added up all the sentences for each one, and then that's the total number. And we just <coughs> reduce it by a ballpark 40%, which I, I'm not criticising the 40%, because clearly I would say it should be greater than 40%. But I mean, where do we get the 40% from? It becomes more um, difficult to understand and to analyse. Whereas... Put the, in, introducing the cons uh, consecutive concurrent um, step. Because by this means, and again, I'm saying this with full sympathy for the judge, um, one might easily just get to the point where the judge sits back, doesn't do any of the fine um, thinking about this, says, well, the maximum is two years. Looking at all of this, I think this is eight months. Yeah. Trouble is, it, it is a bit impressionistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that Lovett has made it a bit more, at least superficially Objective. scientific. Yeah. But um, uh, on the rare occasions when I did actually have to send people to prison for contempt of court, it was rather um, impressionistic. Well, I, I, and clearly, I, it, it is um, a matter of judges heard the evidence, I accept that, and they formed a view, um, and, and that's something that this court and my other friend and I have not had the benefit of. Um, but uh, given the, the importance of the application and the seriousness of the consequences, in my submission that it isn't just a case of, um, well, I can, uh, I can go up to two years, I'll give you eight months for my conclusion. I mean, the judge would still have to have it. And love it makes it clear you've got to, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a right. framework. That's, so my grand, Lord, that's, that's my three. That's ground three. That's ground three. Okay. My lord, the um, the next the ground is suspension. Whether it should have been suspended or not, um, I accept that the end of each. Um, allegation, the judge um, does say, and I conclude it's not, um, it would not be right to suspend the sentence. We can see, for, you know, for example, um, just picking on one, uh, on page 65, paragraph, uh, well, it's not paragraph numbered, unfortunately, but at the end of um, the first breach, the, last line, uh, the second last sentence, and, and then considering the sentence. Uh, and, if, and consider if that sentence should be suspended. I've come to conclusions that suspension would not be appropriate. Um, and in, in similar sort of words, that's the judge's conclusion on each on each matter. My submission, um, my lord, uh, yes, the judge has considered it, but why is it why why is it that this 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 sentence shouldn't be suspended? Um, there's been no reasons given, particularly as this is the first time that the defendant has been. Uh, in breach of the order, um, the um, it, given that he is the carer for the autist, his autistic son, um, given that he that together in the order he's been ordered to pay two hundred and sixty thousand, which is effectively and and cost. I, I don't understand what that's got to do with it at all. Well, in terms of uh, that wasn't, punishment, that wasn't a penalty for for disobedience. That was a, a civil judgment for um, I, I, my lord. That's, um, but, but, but in terms of the house. overall effect of the order is that as a result of this neighbour dispute he's now going to lose his home um, so uh, in, in terms of um, 
should he be sentenced to prison for not complying with the terms of the injunction in my submission, it is a relevant matter that should be taken into account. Does it really bear on whether or not the sentence should be suspended? Um, the, the purpose of a suspended sentence, my lords will know better than me, but the, the purpose of a suspended sentence is it's, it's sort of Damocles hanging over uh, the ultimate I can quite understand that my lord. in these circumstances the judge might very well have suspended sentence mm. um, in order to secure compliance. Yes. Um, doesn't seem very likely um, that he was going to do so, but he uh, should she have might have done. Uh, had she had your, he not your, your, complied, your case has got to be that she was bound to suspend it, my lord. Yes, because he was, it's his first time. He's never been. He's a man of clean, uh, good record. Um, he's uh, he has got responsibilities for the son, uh, his son who cares for in the house. Um, he should be given the opportunity to comply with the order before, with knowing that if he doesn't comply with the order, he will be sentenced to to prison for the number of days that the judge had ordered. So it's a, um, a custodial sentence, in my, in my submission, is the last okay. resort. But e even in the face of a man who has made it perfectly clear to the court that he's not going to obey this order? My lord, if, it's, if the order is suspended, the period of custody is suspended, then uh, it would certainly bring into focus um, the importance of complying with the order. And if he doesn't, well, then it's straight to prison because he's breached the terms, bre breached the... Uh, the order, and he's, uh, the, 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 he would be committed to prison. But of course, he had previously been served with the order endorsed with a penal notice, warning him he could be sent to prison. My lord, yes, I accept that. Um, he's been warned, but there's a very big difference between reading it on, in black and white and then being sentenced um, to um, 252 days in custody, but suspended for a period of two years. Uh, there's a big difference, uh, and. It is a warning shot, the final warning shot, and that final warning shot should have been given. My Lord. Um, that just leaves us with... Um, leaves, leaves us with um, the, the level of the sentence. My Lord's got my submissions in terms of that. Right, th th that's really a, 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 an over... It is. I, I, I'm not going to repeat myself. I realise I've gone long... Um, uh, it, my, so Lovett makes it quite clear in terms of um, categories and uh, banding and in my submission for example like allegation 9 is, it, it is excessive it's not an A1 ca um, band uh, and what the judge the approach of the judge was to uh, was by putting it in more ex uh, more extreme categories um, it, led, it increased the level of the sentence that was to be imposed uh, and it didn't reflect the the, the facts right. so I'm, eight, eight, eight months manifestly excessive my, my, indeed my lord um, in practice I was just um, <coughs> looking at this um, your client has served 47 days yes um, and he was taken into custody on the day. He was taken into custody on the day. He now recognises, in the sense that my instructions are that I, I haven't I haven't met the man. Um, the, op the time given, I wouldn't have the op didn't have the opportunity to, to take instructions directly from him. But he um, he understands the significance of what's happened and that he must now comply with the order. Um, well, um, the the time served, if one doubles. The 47 days um, it approximates to three months. Yes. Um, and so if he had been sentenced to three months immediate, he would be yes. being released around now. Indeed he would. And, 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 and if, if my lords are against me in terms of the earlier arguments, then in my submission, the, the significance of um, the, the extent of the sentence that's imposed is massive, uh, is... Um, too large, too big, a uh, too long a sentence for what actually uh, what was found to breach the breaches. Uh, particularly when one considers that in all of it, the most significant breach and most and the most significant sentence was for the submission that was made in the oral application for permission to appeal. I mean that takes off 
168 days. Yes, it is. Yeah. Or, or scaled down 60% of 168 days. That's 100 days. Um, so you obviously need to go further than that because I, I think do. that gets well, you I, to about I, 150 it, it, days it, 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 well, so it, I would say there should be no order in respect of allegation 9 uh, and then apply your um, if, if you're on, your lordships are against me in terms of everything in terms of the approach of the judge of 60% of, of uh, and when one then does um, all uh, in my submission then it should all run together um, that should bring a point, a point at which I, my submission uh, the defendant should be released now, having served the time that he has. Unless I can assist your lordships any further, I apologise for going on. No, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Colby. Thank you. Yes, now, Ms. Anslow, it's always a, um, a, a delicate business being the, the respondent to a committal appeal, um, uh, uh, and indeed you made clear that you understood the position when it came to sentencing in the court below as well. But we, we would um, welcome any help that you want to give in relation to the first issue about the witness statements, um, not necessarily at any great length, but just to know what your position is there, um, and if you feel it appropriate to comment on matters concerning sentence, uh, also your submissions there. We've read your helpful skeleton argument. Well, I think I'll be able to um, contain most of my submissions in relation to ground one. I might briefly want to refer to the um, other grounds. By all means. But, um, so with regards to, to ground one, I have obviously considered the, the case laws that your laws have helped me um, provide in last night, and I do acknowledge in those authorities that the pertinent point is that in committal hearings, even when a statement is served and placed in a bundle, it's not admissible until it's deployed by the defendant in that committal application. I acknowledge that is the starting position that we're at. Um, so the question here is well, what is meant by deployed um, in those cases? Um, and we would say that, so and the, the point therefore is, so if Mr Coates did not deploy that evidence, then the court could not consider it. And if Mr Coates did deploy that evidence, then the, the, uh, the court was entitled to consider it. Therefore, if the respondent um, to the appeal today can show that the evidence was deployed, then we would say the conclusion must be that the judge was um, right to consider it in her judgment. We obviously do not dispute that Mr Coates refused to call his evidence, um, and because of that decision, he didn't wish to call his evidence, he did avoid being cross-examined on it. But the story does not end there, because ultimately we say that Mr Coates did choose to deploy his evidence. And the, I would refer you to the supplementary bundle at page 258. And in his closing submissions, about two thirds of the way down, um, Mr. Coates says, my witness statement, which I said, if you read it thoroughly, is part of my evidence. So Mr. Coates specifically in his closing submissions refers the judge to it, asks her to consider it, and specifically I would like you to consider it thoroughly. In addition to that statement, as my lords have already pointed out, um, there have been, there are numerous other examples of him deploying this evidence during the course of the hearing. Notably, he um, refers the uh, Miss, Miss Coates to it in cross-examination. Well, there are at least a dozen references to exhibits put yes. to her in the cross-examination. Yes, my lord, and all of these are attached to his witness statement. I won't take you to each of those no. individually. Does, in, it, does it matter? I mean, if an exhibit, suppose it's a photograph, if I'm cross-examining my witness, I can show them a photograph, whether it's in evidence or not, and if they say, yes, I accept that that is what is on the ground, then it becomes their evidence. And if they say no, that's I don't accept that, then if I want to put it in evidence, I have to call a witness to say I took this photograph. But but simply putting a document to a witness in cross examination is not actually putting it in evidence, is it? My lord, I'd accept it may not be putting it in evidence, but it is deploying it oh, for I the see. purpose of the proceedings. <coughs> we would say that it has been deployed, it's been used might be a better term. And it's has clearly I been see. Where does um I mean it, 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 it's a perfectly ordinary helpful word but 
deployed and used, are these your formulations? Um, or, or, or are you going to get some help from somewhere else? I, 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 can, um, I can take you um, to, to the authorities yes. on the, the, the terms deployed and used. Um, so if we look at um, um, 3B. It's the passage we were asked to read. It is. It's at 638E, roughly. Um, 638E, yes, I see, third, fourth line of the paragraph below that. Yes, and so it's specifically um, referred to there, and then again at... Well, deployment is um, achieved by reading it or relying upon it. Yes. According to that um, method. And we would say it has obviously been relied upon in the invitation to the judge to read it thoroughly and confirmation that that is evidence. Well, I so, think the reading is, is not being done by the judge, but by the, by the respondent. By the respondent, but he obviously invites the judge um, to read it. So we would say that, that obviously the, the respondent, um, to the, the application he, he had read it, he invited the judge um, to consider it, and so therefore he was relying on it. So we would say that he's satisfied he has deployed it um, because he's invited the judge to read it um, and he has relied on it, um, both in terms of his closing submission saying this is my evidence and secondly he's relied on it by using it in the course of his cross-examination. I mean, what's tricky, as I, you obviously appreciate, is, is really Mr Coates is asking the judge to proceed on a basis that she cannot proceed on because either this is evidence, in which case Mr Coates is liable to be cross-examined, or it's not evidence. And Mr Coates nevertheless says, having chosen not to give evidence, please look at my evidence. It's part of my evidence. My Lord, that's right. But what I would say in relation to that he is liable to be cross-examined, but it um, would be the case that given what the judge relies upon in this case is an admission, it wouldn't be a point that he would have been cross-examined on in any event. So the fact that he wasn't invited to be cross-examined makes no material difference because that is not a question that would have been put to him. It wouldn't be common form to say, do you still admit to this? But I don't think he could have insisted on, on him being cross-examined in circumstances where he didn't want to rely on the evidence. Um, no, it, it couldn't have been insisted to be cross-examined, but the fact is he chose to rely on the evidence yeah. and the, 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 um, the claimant in the committal didn't seek for him to be cross-examined because there was no need to do so. But also we know because there was a, an exchange in which you were involved um, at the very end of the passages we were shown earlier on that you didn't try to stop his statement being considered um, and you just said well you're not going to be able to give very much weight to it, it'll be treated as hearsay <laughs> evidence and, um, and, and it will attract very little weight, wasn't that your... That, that, you, uh, so uh, your response wasn't, um, wasn't to say no, he, he, he's I, either one thing or the other. Um, uh, it, it was to um, it, it was to say it's just going to be there, and you're going to give you'll, you'll weight give to it, but not much. What weight is as you see fit? And we would say that, as um, your lords have already um, looked at, the conclusion the judge reached wasn't solely based on this admission. It was a combined conclusion, having considered all of the evidence. Well, what we what we need to to, to know as best as possible, and it may may or may not make any difference to this appeal, but. Um, before we part from this subject, is do you stand by what you said to the judge? Um, or having had the advantage of listening to um, the submissions of this court, do you want to say something different? My Lord, I suppose I, I would temper what, what is said to the judge. It, it is correct that if this evidence is before the court, then, um, and it has not been called into evidence, it is only hearsay evidence. Obviously, the question for my Lord first would be whether it is right that it remained in the bundle in the first place. Yes. And we'd say, of course, that has got to be correct, because as the case law um, that my Lord's referred us to last night clearly shows, that evidence remains in limbo right up until the end of the case. So the the, the, the respondent to the committal, he had option at any point to be able to call it or not call it or refer to it or rely on it or deploy it in the means that he wished to do so. So, so you come to the same position, namely that uh, what the judge ought to have done um, is to have made clear that Mr Coates did have an election to make. Namely, either he was going to go into the witness box and affirm his statement, 
um, or, or, or it wasn't going to be taken into account? No, we, we don't say that. We say because um, it doesn't, he doesn't, it's not required for him to go into the witness box and affirm statements. It doesn't, deployment of the statement does not require that he goes into the witness statement. And we say that deployment of it only requires him to use that statement, and he has used it in other um, ways. And so, therefore, it, if he's used it, it is therefore before the court, and uh, it is something the court is entitled to consider. And then they must go on to consider, well, this is a um, document that is evidence that has been untested by cross-examination. And so, therefore, they have to, um, the, the court has to go on to consider what weight should be placed on it. The, the appellant's um, position is that it should never have be formed part of the trial bundle from the moment he said that he didn't wish to rely on it. And we saw that obviously cannot be correct because the, the position is it, it's in limbo. It is both there and it is both not there until the point that it is clear that it's not being relied on. And the fact that the, um, the defendant Mr. Coates, did uh, subsequently deploy, both in cross-examination and by an invitation to the judge to read it, he did choose to it, so it was right that it stayed in, but it was, was we do, do accept it was a witness statement untested by cross-examination, and so therefore it was for the judge to decide what weight she should put on this um, untested witness statement. And her conclusion was, when it contained an admission, it was appropriate to rely on it. If, if at least Mr Coates had gone into the witness box and confirmed the truth of his his statement or statements, I can't remember. There, there were two statements. Two statements. If he had gone into the witness box and confirmed the truth of the statements, then you would not have been entitled to disagree with anything in them unless you cross-examined on them. That's correct. Could you have lived with that? <laughs> My Lord, it's, it's difficult for me to, to say in the context, obviously in the context of this appeal, and you've only been drawn to, to three points, and the only pertinent one is in content, um, relation to admission. We absolutely, in relation to the admission, would have been... You obviously would have liked to keep that bit, but you, you would have had to cross-examine on other things. We, we, we would, and there, there are examples in there that um, I would have um, cross-examined him on, but that was his election not to be cross-examined. It, he doesn't get to pick and choose in that sense. We, I, I, I fully accept that the witness statement is, can only be relied on in the co as hearsay because it has not been tested by cross-examination. Um, but it was right that it remained in there because he chose to deploy it for other purposes in the uh, in, in the case. So we say the fact that it was used was right that the, the court it was left in the bundle. But of course, the weight had to be limited. And can, I, can I just be sure? I think it's implicit in what you're saying, but he did have the right to say to a judge, I'm not willing to give oral evidence. I'm not willing to be cross-examined. But I have made statements out of court. I want you to read them as hearsay statements. And you say he had a right to do that? We, I would say he had a right to ask him to... Um, the, the, obviously, it's not for him to say that read it as a hearsay statement. No, I would say that he had a right um, for them to remain in the bundle, and he had a right to refer to those in the bundle, to use them for the purposes of his defence. As he did, he invited the judge to consider it, and the judge followed on by considering it. And then obviously it was for um, the, the judge to consider what way. So my Lord, I suppose I could say that you are right. He, he did essentially say, I want you to consider it, but I'm not being cross-examined on it. And that is exactly what the judge did. But Mr. Colville's submission, as I understood it, was that, was that the choice that Mr. Coates had was a very clear one. He could either go into the witness box and adopt his statement, at which point he laid himself open to cross-examination, although he, in answer to any particular question he could refuse to answer on the grounds of self-incrimination. Or no use could be made of it at all. And I think you're saying, no, those weren't the only two choices open to him. He could also do what he did, which is to ask the judge to read it. And that by asking the judge to read it, it had the same weight as other hearsay statements, which is not very much, except insofar as it contains admission. I have to say, my instinct is that if you hadn't then chosen to cross-examine Mr Coates, you would have had to accept the, that it was all true. If it had been called, I would accept that if, I had, if he hadn't been cross-examined. But he didn't choose to call it, so therefore there was no obligation. Hmm. All he asked is for it, it to be used in the purposes of his defence. Well, I can't see how it could be evidence in, to be taken into account in Mr Coates' favour 
without him uh, exposing himself to cross-examination. And if he exposed himself to cross-examination and you chose not to cross-examine him, then you would have to accept that everything he said was true. Um, well, perhaps I misunderstand you. I, 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 do, I do accept if, we had, if he had um, refused to be cross-examined or indeed um, that if I, we had chosen not to cross-examine him. That wasn't an option available to the, the claimant because he had indicated that he, he was not um, willing for his evidence to be called. So I, I fully accept that in those circumstances that the, the weight has to be limited on what the judge could rely on those statements, but it doesn't mean that they are, in, are inadmissible. They were admissible in these proceedings because the, de the defendant had specifically referred the judge to them and used them himself. And so, therefore, it was something in consideration was allowed to be used. I can see that if it's appropriate to proceed on the basis that Mr. Coates sought to deploy the evidence, mm -hmm. then it was appropriate for the judge to have regard to them. But I can't really see how the judge could then have regard to them except for the admissions. Uh, I can't see that it's open to a respondent to a committal application to say, look, I want to treat this as a hearsay statement. Either it's got, he's got to expose himself to cross-examination, and if the other side don't choose to cross-examine him, then the contents are taken to be true. Um, uh, or alternatively, the respondent can't rely on the evidence at all. Yes, but and we would say there is a difference between the, the respondent, Mr. Coates, relying on it. Um, obviously, we would say that he cannot rely on it, but um, the, the the claimant in in the matter, we would say. Well, when it contains an admission that they can rely on it, because if we, we accept the premise that this statement exists only as hearsay at this point, um, it is a point that um, that is not a point that would have been subject to cross-examination, and so therefore it is right for the claimant and right for the court to rely on that admission. But I think you accepted at the outset that you could only rely on it at all uh, as an admission once he's said, please read it. Exactly. We accept it, ha it has got to be deployed. So I, I, I do accept... So if he, if he had said, I, I don't want you to take it out of the bundle, I'm not giving evidence, you couldn't rely on it as an admission? Absolutely. Unless, of course, later on he changed his mind. Because the, the position... Uh, yes, you, 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 you retain the right to choose whether to give evidence right up until the last exactly. moment. So we would say, obviously, at the point that he said, um, I don't want to call my evidence, that, that is one line in the sand that says, OK, the court can't consider it. But then quite soon after that, he then uses it himself. And then at the conclusion of the case, he asked the judge to consider it. So this point of it being in limbo, it has come in and out. But the, the concluding point, <coughs> it is in. And so therefore, the judge was right to consider it. Right. Um, well, how much does all this matter to the <laughs> appeal um, that we're hearing on your submission? My Lord, obviously in, in relation, it only um, matters in relation to this single admission, we would say. There is, there is an admission regarding the L-shaped structures, um, but as uh, my Lords have already um, had their attention drawn to, this was not the only basis of the conclusion. The judge specifically refers to Miss Turner's evidence. She goes through what can be seen in photographs. Um, and confirms that, that it's not actually being challenged um, by the defendant. So we would say that whilst it is one limb of her conclusion, even if the, um, my lords found that this admission could not be relied upon, the same conclusion would have been reached. This isn't it a case... It case where, 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 where... I mean, it seems to me that the central point is it wasn't a case where whether or not his evidence... Uh, he, he had found any evidence about it. It was being suggested that the structures weren't there. Um, ab absolutely not. We, the the, the defence was on an entirely different basis to, to do with legal theorising. The defence was essentially, I don't accept I should have to remove these structures, so... And, and, I, and I can't because it's not my land. Absolutely. Right. But, so I... Uh, so you say, there's no to say it's completely immaterial. The, the finding would have become the same, and the judge is very clear in her reasoning as to everything she's considered in relation to Miss Turner's evidence. Is that ground one? That's ground one. Actually, that's only 28 days of the total, isn't it? It is. My Lord, I am conscious um, of the time, so I will 
try and be as brief as I can in relation to the Please. other grounds. Um, ground two, which is the threatening behaviour um, in breach of paragraph 16 of the order. We would obviously refer to the fact that this is a finding of fact of uh, the judge. She yes. found on reading that that she considered it to be um, a breach of the order. Um, we would say that you should only interfere with a finding of fact if it is plainly wrong. And that is that the, uh, it was inappropriate for the judge to come to that conclusion. Um, it should be noted that the defendant declined um, to give evidence to explain an alternative version of events and that the judge heard from, um, heard from Ms Turner and she accepted her evidence that she considered um, that she felt threatened by that statement and she was therefore entitled to uh, come to the conclusion she ha and she did. The suggestion by the appellant that in the absence of corroborating evidence undermines this finding can't be right. The judge considered the words used by A, applied it against paragraph 16 of the substantive order and came to the conclusion that it was a breach. The mere lack of corroboration doesn't make it wrong. But in any event, in addition to having the transcript, the judge had the evidence um, of Miss Coates, where she said, in the light of this open threat made in front of a High Court judge, I am fearful of what the future holds for us. And that's at uh, that's page, Ms. Turner. That's Ms. Turner's evidence. Yeah. That's at page 40 of the uh, supplementary bundle. The judge interpreted the um, appellant's words as a threat, accepted that Miss Coates felt threatened, and clearly this is a reasonable conclusion to have made in the absence of any evidence to the contrary. So we would say in the circumstances, you can't be satisfied that the conclusion the judge reached was plainly wrong. I would also just briefly refer to the comments made in relation to the order itself, that, that it is correct that the basis must be to otherwise intimidate. That, a part of paragraph 60 of the order, does not require that it is directed in the sense of it is said directly to uh, Miss Turner, it, said, it says that the defendant must not otherwise intimidate. And we would say, therefore, an intimidating um, statement made in her presence, which is clearly directed at the situation that they are in, would be enough to breach that order. Unfortunate that in paragraph seventy-two, my lord, which page? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, it's at page fifty-four. Um, I'll remain bound, but um, we don't have exactly what the judge said. I, I haven't looked to see where the laughter came in during the course of the submissions. Um, but she, she's referring to something that happened during... I the, believe the, it isn't recorded, the laughter isn't recorded no, in the transcript. Can, can, you, can, we, can we see in the trial record um, where, where this point is being, is being dealt with? I will. I'm sure we can run it to ground. cross-examination when yes, the yes. judge interrupts. I will.
Um, well, I, I, I think we might start at page 252. <coughs> Um, because we have at the bottom of that page reference to you um, making your closing submissions about this passage. Um, and clearly there's no reference to any, any laughter, but I suppose it might have been at that point. I, um, it, it could be... Um, my Lord, I, I don't want to say it was at that point. I don't recall the exact point um, the, the laughter happened. No, but I'm looking to see... I mean, the, the other references to Miss Justice Mead are not in this context. 170, where he's simply relating um, an appeal to the Supreme Court um, and reference back to the earlier hearings. Um, that, so he's he's speaking then page uh, one seven zero. That that is the point. I don't recall it specifically being in the transcript, but the fact that the, the uh, defendant laughed, I think it's probably unlikely that it was recorded in the transcript, the no. fact that he laughed. Well, of course, but it, it rather looks like it might have been at the point where you were making your closing it, it does appear to be that that would be the right point. I'm obviously making this submission. Because I, this I, don't, I don't think so far we've managed to, between us all, identify a point in the transcript that um, lends itself. Likelihood is it two to by two? This point being considered at all? Uh, yes, my lord. I, I think I, I would say that the, the likely um, position is at two five two. When I'm making my closing submission, saying that this should be considered a threat, um, that the uh, defendant at that point laughed, um, and the, the judge has recorded that at, at some point when this statement is being made. Um, he says Mr. Coates laughed when it was suggested that this is a clear threat in his own words in front of the judge. Um, and so therefore, it's, um, I, I think, um, my lord, you're probably right at the point that that laughter happened. But uh, it, it, it's impossible at the, for the moment, unless anybody has a note of the judgment that can help us. It's difficult, I'm re reading from paragraph 72, difficult to see what he could possibly have meant if it were not a threat something, a criminal charge, a criminal matter. We, we, we have no help with what was inaudible to the transcriber. Um, my, my Lord, we don't. I, I, I do accept that. We, Page we would... 54. Yeah. My Lord, I just don't have a delude. Um, to commit could be a word would fit in there. Well, but we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know. I mean, obviously, there, there are a number of things it could be, but um, we we don't have a verbatim transcript of what um what was said there. And I don't think it would be appropriate for us to try and put the words in that none, no one can be completely no. sure of what was said. No. Um, so I'm grateful to my learned friend for that suggestion. The we, the, the the pertinent point is the judge made a finding that she considered this to be a threat. All right. And you should be very slow to interfere with that finding of fact. Yes. My lords, um, with regards to uh, ground three, concurrent or successive sentences, and um, ground four, manifestly successive, I don't intend to address you in too detail. Obviously, you have my skeleton argument on that. The only point in relation to the concurrent or uh, um, successive sentences I would add to my skeleton is just to remind the court that there isn't a prescriptive um, approach to how sentencing 
um, is that there isn't step by step this must happen or this must not happen. And the important point is the judge had the concept of concurrent and successive sentences in her head. She refers to that at the outset. And she does fully consider the totality principle. She steps back and she asks herself, what is the minimum sentence um, appropriate that is appropriate and proportionate? And we would say that having the knowledge that she has um, knowledge that a concurrent sentence is a possibility, and then seeing that she has um, actually considered the totality principle and stepped back and made a significant reduction as a result, you can infer that she did consider um, at each stage whether it should be concurrent or successive and concluded that it did not. The mere fact that she hasn't specifically stated it again in relation to each individual allegation does not mean that it wasn't considered. And in any event, the totality principle is a, a, a saving grace in the fact that um, she, regardless of the conclusions she has come to at any other point, she steps back and has to consider whether looking at it all, it is appropriate. So therefore, that covers um, the position of whether or not she did have it in her mind. But we would say that it is right to infer that she did for what is said in these judgments. Um, my Lords, I won't address you um, any further than what I've already put in my skeleton arguments in relation to the manifestly ex um, excessive, unless you would wish me to. Nothing my learned friend said, I think, changes um, the uh, respondent's position on that. And the same can be said in relation to um, the uh, failure um, to consider suspension. Nothing of my respondent's submission would change the respondent's position as detailed in my skeleton argument. But of course, if you'd like me to address you on all of that, I'm more than willing to do so. I'm just conscious. The, the, the time is not an issue. It's, um, uh, it, it's only uh, that you should say what you have um, have to say. I'll just ask with my lords whether they have any questions for you. No, I, I, if I may say so, I think it's a very appropriate stance to take. Um, you've given us all the material that we might need. Thank you, my lord. Um, and um, we understand the submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any reply? My lord, just two points. Um, my lord, in terms of the uh, submissions on deploying, um, in my submission, deploying is not reading. Uh, deploying is, is presenting the evidence in the form of sworn evidence and evidence on which the court can then make a judgment as to what are the salient facts on which to decide whether or not um, the defendant is in contempt of court. So deploy is more, to be construed more as than just to a, a litigant handing up a statement and saying, can you please read that? And then that engages um, a, a, and enables the court and the judge to rely upon that statement, albeit not a statement that's been... Well, made. that's not what's said in, in Re B, is it? Well, it, it, it does say, but when but it must, in my submission, be seen in the context of when being to read a statement, to read clearly when you call, call a witness, um, they will produce the witness statement and say, that is my evidence. Uh, in chief, and the court has read it, and the uh, parties have read it, and then the, he's, presents, he's presented for cross-examination. Um, to, to conclude that reading um, a it's Reading or relying on? Reading or, uh, in both re reading and relying on, there has to be evidence. It cannot, it cannot just be handed in as a quasi um, evident, uh, 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 statement of fact. Um, which the court can rely on part, <coughs> and part and not other parts, because that's in my submission. It takes me leads me to the second point, and that is the court must ensure that there are sufficient safeguards in particularly a, a, con uh, a contempt application to ensure, in, as in this case, a litigant in person is. It's made quite clear that what is going to be, what are the, what is, what steps are to be taken, and in terms of his evidence how the court will deal with the application where, and how he has to respond, whether he, whether he is going to give evidence or not. He has an option, and that option makes it clear um, as to how um, the court will then, uh, how, how the defendant will then deal with the question of evidence and how he wants to address the court. Uh, and those safeguards need to be put in place to ensure that when a court, county court judge is faced with a, a Committal app, a committal contempt application, that uh, and faced with a litigant in person, that they are not 
struggling to deal with? How do we deal with uh, a litigant person trying to do that which is not possible? Namely, here's my statement, but I don't want it to give it to, it to be evidence. But I want to make submissions based on it. And and those safeguards need. And in the absence of those safeguards, then my lord, the um, the 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 appeal for a petition should be allowed. Unless I can say something about it. Sorry. No, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Connor. Um, rise now and I'm, I'm sorry for the inconvenience to those who travel but we will give our um, decision today uh, obviously but we will um, think about this and give it at 3.30 this afternoon. Yep.